don't like it. I was just thinking, is my room suddenly just going to go dark because of the, the eclipse? Oh, right. So if I do, just know. We know. We're having a, natural, a moment. A yeah. historical moment. <laughs> a historical moment. Yes, that's the way it should be put. I don't know if you're if you're uh, where you're at, but um, th- today is the eclipse. So here in the states, so everyone is all caught up in that. Uh, I don't know what to expect. I'm like, it, I was just thinking, is my room suddenly just going to go dark because of the, the eclipse? Oh right. So if I do, just know we know we're having a, natural- a moment. A yeah. historical moment. <laughs> a historical moment. Yes, that's the way it should be put. Are you? Are you? Are you? Uh, I, I don't know where, where are you at right now. I'm in Vancouver. I'm usually yeah. based in London, but I'm yeah. in Vancouver right now. Uh, okay. So yeah. I don't know what the viewability is from Canada, but uh, you know, and if, uh, I think it's supposed to happen here. And I'm right now. I'm in Atlanta, or just outside Atlanta. Um, I think it's somewhere 145. It's something supposed to happen, so we'll see. Okay, okay. It's rainy uh, here, so I don't think I'm going to see anything. Oh. <laughs> well, it's okay. Uh, but thank you for, for being on the show today. This is um, like uh, I was looking at your bio and I'm like, wow. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, like, I, and uh, I was looking at your um, the some of the clips of some of the stuff you've done. I was like. I don't know if it's possible to have been more impressed with like, there was like a couple, like I had to, I need to find out some of these projects cause they look really good. Oh. I'm like, what is that? I want to, that I want to see on. I need to know what the name of that is. That was good. She was so good in that. Uh, there's a, I guess, uh, uh, I forget the, what, what the scene was, but I remember th- I'm thinking to myself, Wow. I mean, and that's only like 20 seconds on screen. Okay. <laughs> All right. Was it the uh, one where I was getting drowned by a... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, what is going on here? Just a bit of waterboarding, like actual, that was real, real waterboarding. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That was crazy with Mark Strong. Yeah. On yeah. Deep State. It's a Fox show called Deep State. Oh, Deep State. Yeah. 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 I know Deep State. Sure. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. We are here. Uh, I am Darren Jenkins, and um, this is Conversations with Darren Jenkins. I'm here with Samantha Coughlin, a Canadian-born actor who can be seen in Nick, next scene in Nick Cage's new film, Arcadian, and also Samuel, this is like crazy, Samuel L. Jackson's film, Damage, both opening on April 12th. I, I mean... I think that just says it all. You're, I mean, you're going, you're going to be in a Nick Cage film and a Samuel Jackson film back yeah. to back, same day. That's crazy. I know it's kind of random, but it's kind of fun. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to see it because, um, just based on what I've seen of you as an actress, fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. and, I, I was um, on text earlier today before the show um, to one of my co-hosts on one of my other podcasts. And I was like, I said, you need to watch this. This is the person that you talk about. Like, so we do this film, um, this film and um, soundtrack podcast called the uh, track list. Yeah. And my co-host Chris Saunders always talks about actors who can do, who do like these little nuanced things in a scene to kind of just, put it off the top, you know, right up over the top. And I saw a lot of that in one of these clips. And I was like, you need to see this because if we can find a film of hers that did has a great soundtrack, we we should probably do it. Um, Cheers, mate. Thanks. (laughs) So 
um, where, so you're, you're Vancouver. Are you originally from Vancouver? Yeah, I was I'm born and raised in Vancouver. And then I went to theater school in New York. So I moved at 19 to New York. And then I came back to Vancouver. And I just had theater in my bones then from then. Right. And I met someone and he was moving to London. So I followed and I was in, have been in London. Well, I was in London for 17 years, which oh, is a long wow. time. So Before long time. And then the pandemic happened. So I kind of like regrouped to Vancouver, but I keep now I go between the two. I think uh, I think uh, COVID really mess mess with people, and a lot of people moved around. Like I, I feel like half my friends kind of relocated either during COVID or right after COVID. Um, right, regardless well, of where you were. At, so exactly, but I think most people it just had you reassess your values, and mine was to be close to family during that yeah. time. So. Yeah. That I makes came sense. Back, but I can't quit London, so. <laughs> <laughs> But interestingly, that's actually what the Nick Cage film is about. Is, oh, really? Is, is, it pretty much is basically as, as if the pandemic, well, kind of actually where the world is at right now. Right. Post-pandemic, post, um, you know, um, extreme environmental changes, post-war. Right. Sort of where the world is going right. to, which we kind of already are going. Yeah. yeah in this kind say. of like apocalyptic sense of where where basically all the borders kind of come down and everybody has to fend for themselves and do a run for the border and in this film they do a run for a border and they end up in um um in the irish countryside in far oh, interesting yeah which okay. is totally possible totally yeah possible. yeah because there's i mean yeah. there's a lot of land it's not you being leveraged in you know right so that's exactly. interesting yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So basically they take over farmhouses and my family happens to be um, from like sort of wealthier American stock. And then Nick Cage's family is 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 not not as wealthy. So, okay. yeah. yeah. Wow. That's a thought. Like, I, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm one of those people like after COVID, I was like, hmm, I need to start thinking about plans in case there was like some just disaster or zombie apocalypse or something. So well, right. Yeah. And originally, like maybe a couple of years ago, that would have sounded a little nutty. Like a little nutty, if, yeah. If you were like stockpiling toilet paper, <laughs> <laughs> that would sound crazy. It's like, Dan, uh, uh, are you but okay? Now, <laughs> right. And now it's like that sounds reasonable. Good for you. Good. That's like planning ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My so my um, brother-in-law, he. Like during COVID, yeah, like after, like because he was in the military, um, yeah. he that is his thing. He's like, we will, like, we have, we will be good should something happen. Don't worry. I'm right. um, like, he, he's like, you know, we just, we've, we, we were taught to be prepared. And he's like, I just took that to heart during COVID. I'm like, okay. All right. There's, hey, like you said, like pre COVID, I would have thought, oh, 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 oh. Uh. But the post COVID smart move, right? And now the way things are, we have a cabin in the like interior of British Columbia out here, which is like in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. Right. And like I genuinely think to myself, like, well, if anything kicks off, like I'm heading there, and I'm just gonna like um... set up shop beside the lake, <laughs> get, <laughs> get get fishing, and like call it a day. Yeah. But, you know, uh, and uh, with a uh, also like in. You know, they talk about this a lot in Canada and, and the way all of a sudden, like the extreme weather conditions that have been happening worldwide. Yes, yes. You know, there, there are going to be climate refugees. That's going to be the next thing. Yep. So, yeah, that's basically what is happening. That's where the, so the writer of the of the Arcad of Arcadian, he that was basically it. It was COVID. He right. was at home. He was with his sons and he started to wonder, what is my relationship in this new world that's that's evolving? What is my relationship with my sons and where's that going mixed with all these the chaos around me and that's sort of the premise of the film now so do you spend a lot uh, much time on screen with nick at all no i have to be honest of course well there's only nine people in the whole film yeah i was gonna so say i mean it's not a big cast so no so there's two families i'm the, i'm the rose family we're sort of the wealthier one as i said and then there's nick and his two sons and they're the f farm across the, across the way from us. And basically my daughter and his son fall in love. Gotcha. But um, 
we don't know. So because this is an apocalyptic world, you don't really interact with people very much. And there are monsters. There are monsters that were all hiding at night. <laughs> that's what that's what sold me on. Like when I read the premise for this, yeah. I was like, oh yeah, I, this I gotta see because yeah. I like I like that kind of story. Yeah. Right. And did you see everything everywhere all at once? That film. Oh yeah, several times. Right. Okay. So the head of effects of that film, that that oh. team. He's who directed this. Oh no, really? That's amazing. Yeah. So his like effects team made these monsters that are that are. Oh, so I definitely have to see it now. Yeah. Wow. And I'm so jealous point, of you. <laughs> at, one, <laughs> at one point during, and, I don't, and you never know with these things like what makes it into the film or what doesn't, but I yeah, think it yeah. does make it into the film. At one point, uh, uh, I had hundreds of live beetles crawling across my face. Okay, so that would be weird. I'm sorry. I would be like, hey, Darren, we're putting what? No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> They're like, I'm leave, good. right? I'm like, yeah, okay. No, seriously, did they really do that? Yep. And you know what? And I was like, you know what? In for a penny, in for a pound. Let's go. Okay. And they had this beetle wrangler. <laughs> <laughs> wow. With, like little Irish man and his son with their like cute little accents holding these briefcases filled with beetles briefcases. and they he's a wrangler like he he oh. and then i was like well what happens if i because they kind of look like cockroaches these ones and i was like what yeah i know it's pretty gross but i was like <laughs> whatever who cares and then right. i i i um i said what if i kill one and he's like oh i'll just feed it to my monkeys at home <laughs> oh my gosh you're like that was not the answer i was expecting Wow, that's incredible. Wow. Right? So monkeys at home, just hanging out at home. It's got some monkeys. I mean this this yeah, just a few monkeys that I can feed the beetles that are gonna be crawling on her face. Exactly. Okay. Um I have to say that has got see that should be the trailer. That should right? be the trailer of you guys telling what happens behind the scene. Because I'm I'm paying to watch that, just just to watch that. I know. When it was happening, I kept saying, I was like so mad that I didn't tell the producer to just start filming the monitor because the whole oh. thing would go, right? Because how it ends up is not how it was at the, on the, on the, on right, the, right, right. And I was like, just to see like a, a person experiencing people dropping live beetles on their face for the first time. And like when the driver picked me up, he was like, you seemed a little, <laughs> you seemed a little shell shocked. Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. Wow. Like, yeah, first time with Beatles all over my face. <laughs> okay, well, it was the first time for everything, right? I mm -hmm. mean, and you're a dedicated actress, so, you know. Right? Um, full, method, full method. I mean, it, I would have to ask him a question. I'm like, uh, just just to be curious, you, you couldn't have done that with special effects? What's up? <laughs> right? I I'm just I saying. Lie. Just saying. <laughs> I mean, it's done now, so I'm, you know, move past it and all that good stuff. That's oh, amazing. I think um, they want to see the real terror in my, my eyes. And you, you know what? I kind of agree with the creative choice there. I definitely, because, yeah. I mean, it, I was watch. we were watching, um, oh, um, A View to a Kill? A View to a Kill. And okay. there's a scene in A View to a Kill, like, where James Bond is, like, Blown, like blown up the, the, the cavern of the, of the headquarters and the director purposely didn't tell um i think it was grace jones uh, okay. didn't tell grace jones that they were going to be like shooting off like uh electrical uh explosions while they were trying to escape the, the, the cavern oh. so you can hear her scream and you oh. can tell it's real like she's uh -huh. like she had no clue this was going to be happening. And I always feel like that does kind of tend to change how, you know, like what the scene is like, you know, so. It's true. That sounds weird. <laughs> that sounds great. Questioning whether you're going to die, though, that, that's, I feel yeah. like that, that's like, that's quite wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's wrong. <laughs> Um, so, but no, to you answer your question. So I do, I do have a scene with Nick Cage. If it made it into the film, I don't know. Like I said, right, right. But he, uh, he was, he's injured, so they had a body double. Um, okay, okay. Damn it! But, I just, I was just curious because I, I mean, I, I love Nick Cage. I mean, he's done so many 
amazing films and i was all like this this was as close as i've been alive. so what's he like what's he like you know um yeah well uh, i heard everyone said that he's really cool and nice and like yeah. the thing I find, and he's obviously having like a bit of a resurgence now yes he event. is like yeah he's on my flight three days ago from london to, to vancouver i watched a new film he's in dream dreamscape and it's about where he starts showing up in people's dreams nick cage in people's dreams oh yeah, yeah. But he plays like like an office, like a, a oh, he's a uh, he's a university professor. He plays this like really nerdy man. He's balding. He's you know. Oh, I saw the uh, trailer for that. Yeah, right? yeah. And he is so it's like this very quirky indie film. He starts showing up in people's dreams, and then what happens? Because then the dreams, he suddenly becomes famous, and he's like an he's like an everyman, and suddenly he's he's in like he's the most famous person in the world, and then the dreams change and. <laughs> He, he people are having nightmares with him right and uh he gets canceled because they're like so horrified by who he is even though he's it's not real but i was like he's so committed this is yeah. the thing about him right now he's so committed to, to everything he does yeah and he's so fucking good like yeah. he really is yeah did you see that uh the um that that feature film he did about himself kind of like the unbearable like um weight of talent or something like that i forget what it was yes he's so good in it like so good. I, I was like this makes sense <laughs> right and pedro pascal's in it oh right? he's so good i like pedro I, that was like i again that film that film totally could have gone the wrong way yeah if if so he wasn't wholly as they all weren't as committed as they were if just like a bit cringe and a bit cheesy right and it was so good yeah and I saw Pig. That was actually really good. Oh, okay. that was a, that was so. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend seeing. It. He, I mean, I, I mean, we, I could talk all day for Nick. I mean, he's so, he's he's. I don't know, man. I'm like, I love that he, his second half of his career, he's just going. He's just doing stuff. He's just working. He's like, and everything is got. He's just like committing fully. That must be really hard to do. Totally. And you know what else? So this also go this 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 touches with on my experience with Samuel L. Jackson, which was uh, very brief, very yeah. brief in Edinburgh. But like again, a man who's I don't know how old he is, but he's I think he's in his seventies. He's in the seventies, I think. Who has been hustling for since day like since the beginning yep. of his career, and he works nonstop in a and in, in, to the highest standard and. Like that takes, and also like jumping countries and cities and films and like yeah. different genres and, and like the amount of work that takes in dedication is just like both of them. It's really, really outstanding. Yeah. Very outstanding, especially, uh, you know, in, a, in Hollywood that traditionally age kind of cuts short your career or, or turns it back a little bit. That, that is not the case for in either of these gentlemen. No. Or you'd think like, oh, I've got enough money. You know what right. I mean? Like, right. I'm getting older. I'm going to pare back. I'm a bit tired. Like, right. no, they're still absolutely going for it. Yeah. No, I absolutely um, love them both. And you're very, uh, I, when I saw that you did both of these films, I was like, that is um, a hell of a coup for you, <laughs> for sure. Thank um, you. Where? So when did you... What initially inspired you to pursue acting as a career? Oh, well, it's a bit cheesy, but. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. It's a bit cheesy. Um, I just always knew. Uh, really? How, how, how long? Oh, like, so I was looking at your, your bio, and you've done a, a ton of work. Like, and yeah. um, it, like, did you start as a kid? Or, or no, I was a very strange child. I was very, very shy, and um, I honestly, it's like it sounds super cheesy, but this is really what happened. I, I was on the playground. I must have been very young, like nine or something. Right. And I was super shy. I I spent a lot of time by myself, like playing by myself. Right. And I didn't. I just kind of had like a, a literally a almost a spiritual moment where I was, I was walking in the playground by myself and I was like, Oh, I know what I'm going to do. 
And that was it. Wow. It was like an epiphany. <laughs> wow. And it, and it really wasn't like I wasn't watching TV and thinking like, I wish I was a child star, even though I did wish I was on the mini pops because I love the mini pops. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't like, I didn't, wasn't anything like that. It wasn't like I watched a TV show and wanted to be there. It was more just like I felt like an internal shift and I was like, that's what I'm meant to do. And so come hell or high water, I just committed to that. And um, I didn't tell anybody because I was like too shy about it. And then when I graduated high school, I kind of just had it in my system that I wanted to study with the best. So I moved to New York and went to theater school there. Wow. And yeah. And so that's kind of like, then I got into, um, I'm, I really love uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman and he went to the same school as me. And oh, right. He did. He went to circle in the square. That's right. I, I was trying, when I heard that you went there, I was, for, I was trying to remember. I'm like, there's something about that that I remember. And it was that, that it was mm -hmm. that he went there as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he did. And he did actually, he, he and John C. Riley, when I was in my final year, they did the Sam Shepard play True West at mm. my school because my school was also a Broadway theater. So we were, we would had school downstairs and then the, upstairs was this was the theater. And so they performed which uh, True West. There's other characters, but there's mainly just the two two guys, right. and they performed True West. And they would alternate every four performances. They would each play the other character. As oh, brother. that's interesting. It was amazing, and just to see two totally different processes. Wow. Like Philip Seymour Hoffman would not lock himself. I mean, I know because I was there. He would lock himself in like our like speech room before the show for hours in the dark and just like. What? Okay. That's yeah. And then John C. Riley was like running around chatting with everyone like every day. You know what I mean? Like two right. completely different processes, but two incredible actors. And then just seeing how each one like four days later would play the other character. I mean, it was just amazing. Wow. But yeah. They're both uh, fan, fantastic ar ar artists, um, and I call them artists because what they were doing, what they were doing on screen was, I mean, they transformed the characters. They, they, they were like, um, I always say they're they're individual. There are actors who, the minute they show up on the screen, you know something amazing is about to happen. Right, something's happening. Yeah, and you you need to pay attention to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, and yeah, and Philip, I mean, he, he just, I mean, he gave every ounce of himself almost maybe to a fault because right. I think he probably had some demons, Right. but he actually, and actually this is an interesting thing. So he, uh, I very much admired that style. So I dedicated myself to that style, which is why I went to school in New York to right. try to train with the best. And when he was doing True West, I wrote him a note <laughs> that said he was my idol. And I slipped it under the speech class Aww. door while he was in the dark and then ran away, <laughs> ran away. So he didn't know who it was. So he never knew. And then I left it. And then, and then, but when I graduated theater school in New York, the number one show in, in on Broadway was um, uh, Death of a Salesman starring Brian Dennehy. Oh yeah. Number, number one show. And I, it was, it won all the Tonys and I was like, if I could see that show, that would be incredible. But I didn't have enough money to right. to go. And I was going to, I remember trying to, I was going to sneak in at intermission, but I didn't. And I missed it. I never saw it. But I was like, I remember thinking, if I could be in something like that, then that would be, I would have hit the top of all my dreams. And then I moved to London in the roundabout way. Because I, I wasn't American, so I couldn't stay in New York. Right. But I could get a visa to, to the UK. So I went to London and my... Uh, probably two years in, mm -hmm. I had an audition and it was for Death of a Salesman because they were bringing the Broadway production to London oh. and I got cast. And wow. I was there. Wow. At our press night, Philip Seymour Hoffman came and I said, I, I sent you a, a note and told <laughs> you you were my idol. And he was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> But it was wow. such a cycle of like how things find themselves, you know, in a cyclical way that you don't expect if you put the energy out there. But yeah, full, anyway, so I met full circle, full yeah. circle. 
I, I find like uh, with acting, um, that that tends to be a. It's kind of why I tell a lot of actors uh, or in the, people in the industry in general yeah. that really like when you're connecting and you're building these networks and, and meeting all these people, um, make friends and be genuine and be nice and be kind because you in in Hollywood and on Broadway, in theater, in, in the movies, on TV, you just don't know when that moment is going to come back around to you. And you don't want to be on the bad end of that. You know what I mean? No. So, and also, you just don't know who you can learn from. Right. Yes. Right? Yes. There's absolutely. also just learning from like, and that's why like, whether I have a small part in something great or I've understudied before in the, in the West end, I, I, I understudied Elizabeth Moff and Kira Knightley in a, in a show called the children's hour. Mm. And in that film was, or in that play was, um, well, them who are amazing, but also, um, Ellen Burstyn, the Oscar oh, winner from yeah. Harvard, and the exorcist. And she is also another idol of mine. And I was like, just to be every day to just be around her for five months, I mean, what more of a gift, whether I'm doing anything or I'm not, which I was obviously doing a lot because I had to learn two parts, but <laughs> I was like, just to be around someone like that. And she would teach us classes before the show because she's the head of the actor studio, or she was. And she would teach us like just for and, and, like the dressers would come or whoever wanted to come could come to the, to the to class. Right. And we would have these like, you know, classes with her. And I was like, just to be around that, like. Yeah, That's invaluable, everything. invaluable. Right. Like, I would, I would, if if I had one person I could have that happen to, for me, it would be Denzel Washington. Yes, right. Like, I, I just want ten minutes, man, because I think ten minutes of of his experience and knowledge and passion about the the art form it would just be amazing. Right. Or even just to see how he orders a coffee. Like how yeah. does he move, how does he move <laughs> through the world? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because, you know, I mean, you see a lot of these people and they're just, you know, I, they're people, first of all, right? They're yeah. just people who exactly. have jobs and their jobs just happen to be um, very, very public. Yes. And, um, but you don't necessarily get to expose that exposure to that experience of what you said and just, just understanding who they are or seeing what they do before, before, after, during a, a performance. I mean, right. there's a lot of stuff to be taken out of that. We, oh, well, that, well, that was the thing. So I, when Phillips, I remember when True West finished, like I went to see the show and then afterwards he would w literally just walk down the street. Mm. He would just like walk off into the night and just like seeing that, I mean, that struck me and stays with me just this, this mm. man who had put on this incredible, incredible work who so many people idolized or wanted to emulate, especially in a theater school. And then he would just do his work and just like go off into the night like a regular person, like to get a bagel or something. And it's like <laughs> all, all that. Yeah, it really stays with you. Yeah, I, I can see that because, I mean, especially when you get like these scene, like um, character, like uh, what was the... Um, not the maestro. Uh, there was another one who did that. Um, I, I remember thinking how intense his character was. And, you know, as an actor, like, I, you know, if you're a method actor, I don't know, like, what your style happens to be, but that energy has to go somewhere after you're finished with it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And for you to say, he finished his role, went walking down the street. It's just so, it's like, that's intense, man. I mean, to be able to transform and then just go, go get, get a coffee. It's, it's yeah. you know, that's hard. To, I feel like that would be hard to do. Right. Yeah. But he didn't like sit around basking in adoration. He wasn't right. like finding things. He just went back to being his regular self. It was right. really fascinating. What, so uh, on that, like what method of acting that have you kind of worked with and, and like, is there a preference? Um, my, I, what I gravitated toward originally when I was young was the old school, uh, like Stanislavski method Stanislavski. of, yeah. of um, the actor studio. That's what I, that's what I wanted to be around. That's what I 
yeah, that's why I moved to New York. Yeah. Um, my school um, circle, it 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 was sort of like they had the attitude of like whatever works for you, <laughs> whatever works, take on board. But okay. they they did operate with that sort of Stanislav, the traditional American style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I I as I never studied formally for as an actor. I've only studied formally as a comedian. Okay, cool. Um, and I I find that it um, it was interesting. Like I, I find like I, I I think there is when you're when you're trying to be an actor or a comedian, I think it's a little bit similar in a lot of ways where um, you take classes to kind of become better and um, learn the craft, you know, be better at your craft. But I think it is, um, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, too. I think, um, at least for me, it was very, it's very, um, it was very, um, I don't know, I, it made me nervous. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, it was, it was <laughs> like, I would go to class, palms sweating, and just be <laughs> like, because I feel like there's so much, and I don't know about maybe it's just New York. Because I, um, I felt like it, there was a lot of pressure to be, to kind of be on a certain level as your rest of the actors or the rest of the comedians in your class. I don't right. know if that's the same, is that the same in, in, as an actor? Maybe, you know, I did a, I've never, I don't really take that on myself, I'm sure. But I, I think I was so, I mean, I also started, like, I went, I went to theater school at 19, so I was really young. Right. Um, I, I, I think it was just so in my soul. I was just committed, interested in what I was bringing to the table and what I was doing. So I, I didn't feel really in competition or anything. I was just, <laughs> just so obsessed mm. with myself <laughs> or, you know what I mean? So yeah, and also, yeah, yeah. I was super shy. So like everything was like, I was just, just to get, just to start getting on stage or performing in front of people took a took a lot out of me. So I was just that, I was focused on that. That but must have been interesting trying to trying to transition out of this shy person into a very you know because I mean although I've heard stories of like actors who said the same similar thing where they were shy when they were younger and whatever, but yeah. and they, they're like well, I'm still shy like it hasn't changed like I haven't. I mean, I haven't really become like this extroverted person. You know, it's I'm still that same person. I just understand how to take certain characters out of the box as I need them. Yes. Well, I think I think shyness can often um, be incredibly useful because uh, a lot of that means that often people have a very strong or you know internal world. Yeah. And they've spent a lot of time with themselves, you I know. Do that too, so don't worry. Yeah. yeah. So, like you know, like I said, I, I used to play by myself. I used to spend a lot of time alone. So then you you start to explore your emotions, or you explore your imagination, or you explore your thoughts, or you you know. So I think I think it it serves itself, but it also means that I definitely get nervous for sure. Yeah. 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 What, but I did find uh, I, I did a writing class because uh, uh, I wanted to have all these ideas. And so mm. I, I did a, a couple months ago um, at the Upright Citizens Brigade out of LA. Hey, that's my pe my people's. No way! I love them. It's yeah. so much fun. Yeah, I'm the New York. I'm on the New York side. Oh, cool! That's awesome. Yeah. What, what writing class did you take? Uh, it was called. Uh, it was a pilot writing class. So like. Oh yeah, yeah. That's where I started. So. It's awesome. So good. And also, so that that was me coming out of my comfort zone. I was so, <laughs> so hard. And that was like, I was like to have to read your scripts in front of the class. That to me <laughs> was like you said about being a, a comedian and being in class. I was like, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> that was, that's exactly what I was talking about. That experience. And, and because, I mean, because I think it made it harder for me because took me a long time to get into a class because the yeah. New York classes are usually sold out like and so when I finally got it I was very like you know excited but it was also a, to me a little bit of a pressure because of because so the the first night the, the first class that I went into 
it, I think there was like maybe 10 or 15, 10 or 12 of us in the room and we're all sitting at the table and they're all much younger than me. I mean, much younger than me. Yeah. And to the point they even asked that question to me, they're like, why are you here? And I'm like, why I'm here? I want to be a writer, you know, but so just from that moment, because they were so younger than me, I was like, felt like a little pressure on, but you know, once I got that second and third class and stuff got going, you know, the nerves kind of started to go away, but, okay. but reading your, reading your script, uh, reading your, ugh, yeah, no. It no. Was... <laughs> I wrote the teacher and I was like, I can't do this. Yeah, it's, I was like, it's I tough. Can't act. Yeah. I was, cause I, I thought, well, I thought we'd ease ourselves into it, but it was like week two or three, like we were reading the full, like full, you know, opening scenes. Yeah. Um, with in casting people and i was like i wrote him i was like jeff i can't do this and Wait. he's like i believe you can and then of course like it was the biggest thrill because then you're like once you get through it and you think you're gonna die and then you've done it i was like yeah, yeah. whether mine was good or it wasn't and i was like i don't even care i'm just like i did it yeah i actually uh, pulled that my first script out um that i wrote there a couple, couple like a couple days ago actually out of the blue i was like oh i'm gonna reread re this to see if it was funny no it wasn't funny it was just not funny. It wasn't funny. I'm sorry. I, I if if I was like, okay, well, it had it had some it had some promise, but I it was I was going on a different direction. It was bad, but I, I but you know what? I had a lot of fun doing the class. I, I mean, in the end, um, and I learned a lot. I did learn a lot. Totally, and challenging yeah. yourself, and also like you yeah. know. We have these things like, oh, people are younger than me or older or whatever. It's like, and it's like you realize it really doesn't matter. Like ideas are ideas. Yeah, it yeah. Really matter. yeah. God, you know, I mean, yes, you know, I, I think what I, I, um, I see other art, other actors and other writers and other comedians doing what they're doing, and it gives me uh, hope to, to see because they're, you know, I know how hard it is and that they that they were able to overcome whatever you know, tri trials or challenges that they had to kind of get to where they wanted to be. I kind yeah. of appreciate that. And I feel like if they can do it, I can do it too. So for sure. Yeah. Um, was, was there ever any particular character that you portrayed that you felt you had a personal connection with? I mean, yes, but I thought it's probably going to sound uh, not very good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, definitely. I mean, I, I'm of the school, which is, uh, of, of thought, uh, I heard Andrew Garfield saying something like this similar recently, similarly. And I, I believe this, which people can agree with or not agree with, but I actually, I believe like we have everybody within us. So yeah. there's that. Okay. So nothing feels far from me. Right. Or too far from me because I feel like I, everything exists within me. Um, but there are my the characters I sort of most relate to. I call them the fragile, volatile women. Okay. And that usually is found in theater and like classic American theater. So, um, like Tennessee Williams, oh, sure, or Sam Shepard, or those those type of women that show up there of like the way Tennessee Williams writes women of of having this sort of um, ferocious vulnerability. Sure. And a sort of poeticness about them. So I have played a couple of those characters, and uh, yes, I, I do relate to them. And they they tend to get like quite deep within me, and uh, yeah, it mm. takes a while to shake off. But yeah, yeah. that that mo yeah, I, I can imagine that um, yeah. when you're playing certain roles that hit home. You know, it's that's why I like when um um. What's uh, uh, Christian uh, Christian uh, Bale? Bale, yeah. He he. Whenever I see stuff that he does, I'm just like, that has got to be like I, that has got to be like you need. I feel like, you know, as an actor, you should have your therapist on speed dial. Mm -hmm. Because, and I was talking about this on my last podcast with Alex Waldman um, about self-care and, you know, because it's, that's kind of part of your tools, your toolkit 
of being able to do the things that you do. And I think when you're doing playing with these very intense characters and very you know, immerse yourself in these rogue worlds that you need to have therapy too to, to kind of balance out your normal life, your your regular life. Otherwise it becomes very difficult. It does. It does. And also like the the work can also I mean, I think theater is is so immersing. It's it's maybe a different and also you theater is like a house. Yep. You you go there every day and people become your family or the situation becomes your family and it, it becomes the place. I, I actually find it like therapy in a sense because you can express yourself to and you're also applauded for it. That's true. So that's that's what I mean about like so Tennessee Williams characters are so these women, which is very rare that women are written like this, have like this beauty, but also this, you know, poetic beauty about them, but also this sort of maybe tortured soul or volatility or violence or whatever within them and you're allowed to express it to its fullest capacity and people when you do say well done as opposed to in life when like, right. they don't like that <laughs> maybe yeah. so like like i feel yeah so i i find that sometimes it can be like where you can really express all the things within you your your full world and when it hits like when the moment hits then it it feels like complete alignment Mm. Yeah. Are there are there um, roles that you haven't played yet that you uh, would like to kind of play? Yes. Well, in, in, within that vein, I think I think I would like to to uh, I mean Blanche and Streetcar, which is along the same line. Oh. I mean, I was born for that. Oh. I know. Okay. It's not the most healthiest of people, but I would. <laughs> 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 but I was, I was, I was born for that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. a, well, so, uh, we, are we talking about on theater, on stage? On, or, stage. on yeah. stage, right? Um, so you've done television, you've done film, you've done theater. Uh -huh. Do you, is there a medium that you prefer? Cause it seems, I mean, you do have a, a very strong theater background, but I've seen you on screen and I'm like, you're super powerful. You. Um, you bring, you have a, like a fantastic presence to, to the characters you bring. So I can see you doing pretty much anything you want. Oh. Um, but I'm wondering if you have a preference. I don't have a preference at all. I think I, I think theater was my foundation. So I maybe gravitate toward that naturally because that's where I started, but I love film and TV and I, I'm doing more film. Um, Vancouver where I'm from is, is very much a, a TV town. Yeah, and I find that in from in Europe, um, I'm le leaning more towards film, which I really enjoy. And my dream would be actually, which is why I did the pilot class out of C Upright Citizens Brigade, is I would love to write my own very very dark comedy piece for TV. Ooh. I was going to ask you if you would want to do some comedy. Yeah, um, I do. I mean, I'm pretty quirky in real life. So I would, there's, I would love, and I would love to have it based out of Canada. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to see some more gritty comedic women come out of, as opposed to just being quirky, but actually some added, some added darkness. Like, have you seen Fleabag? You know, Fleabag? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. actually going to mention Fleabag. Yeah. Yeah. So that vibe. Obviously okay. not that she's done that and right. she's a genius, but, um, but that, uh, that sort of vibe, but coming out of Canada. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, I could see that. I mean, uh, um, I could see that on Netflix or, 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 or you know, as a, as a, and like, I would like to see that as a nice, a part series that right? you know because i think that would be really cool to, to, and i'm 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 a big fan of like um female comedians i love look i love female comedy for some reason i just yeah. they have a, a really great way of uh, sensibility about the writing and um fleabag was obviously such a good good show um I, I, you should do that. You should absolutely do that. If you do that, I, I, I mean, I would watch it. I'll be your first watcher for sure. Okay, thanks. <laughs> and just, yeah, yeah. Well, I wrote it. I mean, I wrote it like in the class, but I don't know if it's any good. Like, oh, so you did actually write, write it. 
I've written a pilot. Uh-oh. Yeah. So, but like you, I need to revisit it because I wrote it a couple months ago and I, uh, I need, like, you do it under the, under the pressure yeah. of things and the structure. I had to learn yeah. about structure, which I, I wouldn't say structure is my, my, where I really shine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good at ideas, but like having the actual structure of a show. I think um, that's every writer, every writer structure is their, the first thing that they struggle with, I think. Right. And, and um, character development. Exactly. Exactly. And things are very clear in my mind, but it's, it's also like comedy. Right. For me, I like walking the fine line of things being quite dark. And right, right. I also want to add an aspect of, um, which I'm quite passionate about is like mental health mixed with the comedy, which I don't think has as, uh, been explored as much as it, as it could be. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. So, but I don't know. I don't know if that's any good. I, I think I need to revisit it and we'll see. Well, <laughs> I'm rooting for you. Thank for sure. you. Thank um, you. I think it would be very really interesting to see what, what, to see that, uh, if, if my do, imagination. Do you know. see, have you, um, somebody somewhere? Have you watched that? I haven't seen that. No. Oh, it's good. But Britt Everett, she was a, she's a comedian. Um, um, she, oh, she, uh, singer out of New York. Right. Um, and she has this show, I think it's on HBO called somebody somewhere. It's really, it's about her. Well, it's like not her, but her basically going, it was written for her to going back home to I, I'm some like Ohio or something like that, like going right. back to a small town as this, uh, and sort of, and actually her name is Sam in the show, but <laughs> revisiting is done really simply, but it's done. Like the characters are so unique and strange and, nothing major happens like it's more just human relationships and it's just really about her coming home and dealing with them um, the death of a family member and alcoholism and it it's just really beautiful so that's mm. the kind of that's the kind of style of like i like the idea of maybe someone from london coming back to vancouver well it's obviously because it's me coming right. back to vancouver and sort of like retouching with home what home means and oh that'd yeah. be interesting yeah, yeah. um What's the most valuable piece of advice you've received from someone and who and from who? It's a good question. I studied. Well, actually, I thought of a quote yesterday. There's a Canadian rap artist name or hip hop artist named Chaos. And I quoted him yesterday when I really liked it. Uh, I tried okay. to live by it, which is don't put don't put salt in another man's game. Put sugar in your own. And I just really like that. <laughs> Good to remember, especially that's when good. people wrong you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. But I studied with a woman named Sandra Seacat, who it was a, is an acting coach, but she doesn't necessarily teach acting. She she recently passed, but she was um, Andrew Garfield's coach. She was Jessica Lange's coach, um, Laura Dern's coach. Right. And she, I studied with her in Berlin right before the pandemic for a month. And it was one of the most intense experiences of my life. But she she teaches Jungian dream work. Oh, so you wow. study your you study your dreams. It's crazy. Oh, well, that's scary. Act, it was it's well this beautiful. And then you you take what you learn and you put it into the scene. So like you ask oh. your it's, it's very intense. <laughs> but wow, she um she we would before class every day in Berlin we would dance around to her favorite song and it was called Free to Be. Um, and it was the song, I think it's from the sixties, but it's basically like, I'm free to be me and you're free to be you and together Mm. we can be. And like, I don't know. I just think like living by that, I don't know. That's like the most important thing, right? Like honoring, honoring who I am, which is hard to do. Yes. (laughs) Honoring you, who you are, which is hard to do to truly honor somebody else and allow them to just be themselves. And then that we can. Just Especially in this day and age, I think right? people need to do more of that and stop facing outside, trying to judge things that they can. Like I tell people all the time, look, I try to treat people nice and kind, each equally, because I you don't know what other people are going through. You just no. know, you don't know. And um, you can't assume that because they're wearing nice clothes and driving a nice car and you have a great job. That everything is just going peachy for them. So um, I tend to. It probably to, isn't because it probably isn't. Yeah, exactly. Which is why they're focused on 
material objects to kind of dress up the, you know, broken mirror. Um, so I I think that's a fantastic I think that's a fantastic one. Um, yeah. And absolutely. then and that and that feeds the artist as well, right? Like if yes. I truly allow myself to be free, then I can really explore the work, the human nature, and then and then I can also express myself to you as an audience member, we can start relating to each other together. Yep. And one, one thing she also used to say, um, she would refer to the artist as, she never used the word actor. It was always the artist. Okay. And I like that sort of thing. Yeah. But um, because the act, acting kind of sometimes gives a, a connotation of like performance. Right. Um, as opposed to like creating some, just creating art. But she would refer to the artist as a wounded healer. And the wounded healer is recognizing your own wounds, right? putting them what, into your work. And then by, by expressing them, whether it within your work, and that can also be through comedy as well. Yep. Um, or very much through comedy. Um, the audience see, sees themselves through their work and then you both are healing yourselves. Huh. So whether wow. you're laughing together, crying together, experiencing you know toward whatever it is to get your the the audience the artist and the audience are doing that together and then that, that way you're both healing oh that's amazing i think that's that i think that's an amazing thing and the process of the audience also being part of the healing process and and vice versa right i think that's because you don't necessarily you don't often hear about like the audience for the most part a lot oh. of people will kind of separate them out. Yeah. Sorry, and I lost you. One sec. <laughs> no problem. I lost. I don't know what happened to the screen. I don't know. Oh, no. Hold on one sec. Hold on. <laughs> but you can keep talking. I can hear you. The audience what? Well, it's usually we ignore the audience. And except for their um, feedback from whatever's going on on stage. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's very... I like when the director or or the artist like understands that the audience is part of the creative process as well. Definitely. Then 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 every then the work, whether like whether it's a whether it's, you know, a TV show, movie, theater, whatever, then it's, you know, it's it's an action. Yeah. And and it's a, it makes it a part of service, yeah. Right, because yep. then you're you're serving humanity in a in a capacity, whether yep. even if it's just entertainment, light light entertainment. That's still, you're still in service. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I think we I, if no one if you didn't learn this at all, you should have learned this during COVID. To be honest, <laughs> yeah. because how many um, like uh, during COVID. Uh, few friends would read so I do like a bunch of different things and one of the things I do also is I run like these um like events for film and television people okay. you know giving them knowledge and connections and you know so during COVID a friend of mine reached out to me and was like hey you should do some virtual events for people because they're losing their minds at home and I was like oh that's an interesting idea so I started um creating like this virtual game show okay. that um, are like in, you know, it was always, it was actors and producers and writers and whatever. And it was, it was just about them, you know, connecting and, and being as, as people, not an industry thing. It wasn't, you know, there was no industry talk and conversation. It was just using this time to kind of connect and be sane and, to help each other and support each other in whatever time, you know, during that time. And it was really, it was fun. It was, it was, I had a lot of fun doing it. And wow. because of that, people reach out to me all the time now, like just to say, Hey man, how are you doing? Oh. You know, And that's valuable. I think that's, you know, it's, it's cool. That's amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Connection. Yeah. Connection. I mean, it's pretty important, right? Definitely. I think so. Why we're here. <laughs> yeah, so why we're here. Otherwise, yeah. we would just be born and live by ourselves. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I don't want to be that guy. You no. Know, so, hey, I, I was looking on your website, and um, 
you are you you're a coach as well, right? I am. Yeah. What was the, you know, what was the impetus behind trying to to, because I feel like you're busy already. Mm -hmm. So for you to want to do this meant it really must must meant, meant a lot for you to kind of offer your knowledge and experience. Yeah, I love it. I love like like I said, I love the communication of it. And, um, it actually, it started, I mean, I, I was, I would always help people obviously before, but it actually came out of COVID where, oh, okay. you know, helping people virtually. Um, and just, I was doing a commercial and one of the, who she's now a very good friend of mine, but it was somebody who was working with me on the commercial, another actor. And they were like, Oh, you know, just through your theater training, I'd love to work more. Um, would you work with me? And I was like, yeah, 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 of course. Wow. And then, and then through that, I've just kind of continued with it. And I, I really love it. And I also really love working with kids. It's, oh yeah. That it's must be fun. amazing. It is. How, yeah. Like, because I've, you know, I always, you know, when you like, whenever I see a film or a television show that has a kid in it, I, it strikes me how difficult that must be mm. for for the kid, for the director, for the other talent. It, because I mean, you're a kid. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the bottom line of it is you're a kid, and so if you don't have the right teachers and coaches around you, um, I feel like it could be a miserable experience for a kid. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but I think that um, if you're teaching kids, I think to, um, if that's what they want to do, um, and they can, you, it, I think it could be really fun. My mom was a teacher. She she te taught for many years, and I would help her kind of do stuff when I would come from school, from college, and and help her with um, some of her classes. So I know how fun and how engaging kids can be, and and how passionate they are when they're, when they're doing it. And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, I, tr I try with kids generally, I don't treat it like a business or anything. It's just, right. just, it's like self-expression. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So if they have an audition, obviously, then you, then you do the, what needs to right. be done for right. the scene. But in general, it's more like, you know, expressing yourself, being comfortable in your body, being comfortable in your voice, being comfortable, you, you know, expressing yourself which is like whether someone gets a job or they don't get a job or they're just doing it for fun or they're just doing it today and they're not doing it tomorrow it's like you're still you know that can only benefit somebody i always wonder I, i'm always impressed because they're better actors than i am sometimes i see them cry on cue and i'm like what i can't do that i mean it's just so impressive some of the stuff that little people can do i'm just like all right that's cool mm -hmm. You know, yeah. they're in touch with themselves. Not all of them, but some of them. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. And I mean, like I, you know, I think I started when I was twenty-one or twenty. No, I was twenty-five when I when I started down this road of you know acting and comedy and stuff. And so mm -hmm. I didn't really have that experience of being a kid in the, in the industry or a kid doing trying to do this. My mom would have never let me. There's no way, um, yeah. but she, I mean, she really wanted me to be an actor. She just didn't want me to do it when I was a kid. She was like, right. you know, if you get out of high school, you can do whatever the heck you want. <laughs> that was probably good advice. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was right on point. Yeah. Otherwise, who knows what, what I, I mean, I don't know, who knows, who knows? who knows, but, um, what's, um, what's, uh, something that, um, you like what piece of advice would you offer like, other actors, young actors who are trying to kind of make their way in like the industry? I think just asking yourself what you really feel you have to express mm. and what is it, what is it that you as an individual have to express and what sort of, what is your unique story or your unique point of view or your unique, your unique self-expression? Mm. That's what I would say. As mm. opposed to feeling like you're trying to fit into 
the cookie cutter boxes of things that already exist. What are what are the stories that you have to tell? Interesting. Yeah. That's yeah, because I don't know how like like um, I have a lot of actors in my like who I connect with, and um, that's a good question. That is actually a really good question. I I, I mean, I wish. I've never heard anyone, no one's ever expressed that to me, said that to me. And I don't know, I think uh, as when you're trying to get into acting, it's almost, um, it's almost kind of, almost uh, this mysterious thing that you, you, you're not sure exactly, like so a lot of people who get into acting, get into acting to me, um for the sake of like for the wrong reason like you right. know and they don't understand like and i think this comes through this ha like i think this is a problem when it comes to auditioning mm -hmm. because when you're not sure why you're in that room it's very hard to deliver the the way you should in that in that moment you know what I mean? It's very hard for you to kind of like it's almost it's, it would almost be like um, telling them to go into the room blindfolded and perform. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you, you should have an idea of what it is you like. I think it's like everything else, like a startup. If you were a startup company or an entrepreneur and you want to do this, have a understanding of why it is you you're trying to do this what what are you hoping to achieve exactly and if you understand your own you know stories to tell or your own self expression then it can, then it will, will always be have an element of being fulfilling but yeah. if you're just trying to live by somebody else's you know uh cookie cutter um you know things that industry stuff then it's gonna it's not gonna be very fulfilling and yeah. and it's very difficult and like yeah exactly it's like what are the go what are the goals like no one it, the goal can never be to just be rich and famous because right. well, first of all even if you achieve that you probably won't be very happy right <laughs> and you can do that with anything to me that's like so general you can do that playing a lottery you can do that being an athlete you can do that yeah you know working at a dentist's office so that doesn't really necessarily answer the question, you know? And if that was it, then Samuel Jackson and Nick Cave <laughs> would have stopped a long time ago because they already achieved those things. And, and, and we're full circle back to the beginning of this conversation. <laughs> Arcadian. Because, exactly. Um, yeah. What's next for you? What's next? Well, I'm in Vancouver right now auditioning. Um, okay. Um, I've had 1 million auditions before I left uh, London a couple days ago for theater, um, uh, Coronation Street, which is hilarious. <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to be on Coronation Street. <laughs> um, as, a, as a cult leader, I was like, that'd be a good part for me, a cult leader. <laughs> a cult leader? Cult leader. Um, so yeah, I'm just back. I'm just back on the, back on the hustle. I was going to ask you, because uh, I asked this to someone else recently um what's your feelings on um so uh, on on like in-person auditioning versus self-tape auditioning you know what i i don't know how i feel about it because on one hand i kind of like the at least for film and tv i kind of like the self-tapes okay do you There's know why because i feel like it uh, for me it, it, it like took a little I don't, I like being in the room with people, yeah. but I don't love, which is actually in London, it's better, but in Vancouver, it's very, it's very much an industry town and you show up and there's, you know, there's other people, like the room is full and you just have to soak up everyone else's energy. And uh, I right. don't love that. I don't like to listen to people doing their, I, I, I prefer to just do my own thing and stay focused on what I'm doing. And I feel like in London, they're a bit better about that. It's, it's less, um, yeah, they spread things out. Um, so I, prefer, in that sense, I prefer self tapes because it's just me and the work and I can just focus on what I'm doing. But then at the same time, I don't like, we all know the self tape is hard. It kind of goes into the, to the ether world and you don't know who watches it or what, how much they, right. I've gotten talk about it recently. So it right. 
mean, it happens. When it comes to theater, I think it's much better for me to be in the room. Yeah, I, I would imagine that's that's better because you're. I mean, it's a it's a medium that in which you're you're working in front of live people as well. So yeah. You know. And like you can just pick up. I had one for the RSC the other day, and like I loved it. And I, if I had filmed it, I really wouldn't. It's just it's like the work is so. It's not like you know, like I said, in film it, it, often in TV, there's structure. It's very clear what the structure is, and uh, right, but in right. theater, it's so dense, and there's so much to unearth, and there's so much to work on. You right. can't do that in a couple of days. So to if I'd filmed it, I wouldn't really have known what I was doing. But to be in the room with them and to speak with them and to go off you know the input or the direction they gave like it just really it just really helped yeah i think um someone else said that to me once um that they like what they like about in person is that they can kind of get some reaction and, and, and you know see some get some feedback and kind of know where they're going in the right direction or not that kind of a mm -hmm. thing but, yeah, you get a sense yeah. of what they're doing. And in London, I really like it as well. They're very good at like, usually when you when you go into auditions, they, they just like start by asking you, you know, where you've come, like, how was your day? And like, what train did you take in? And is it, you know, and they just like do, they, it's very centering. And then you generally just read like from sitting, you don't feel like you have to put on some like performance. Oh, wow. And I work best that way. I, I find that that's, like much better for me than feeling like you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out whether I like, which one I like most to be honest. I mean, to be honest, honestly, it doesn't really matter. I still have to put the work in. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, 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 is it different? Yes, it's definitely different, but I'm okay with even one, I suppose. It is a little unnerving to, like you said, then you send it in, into the Ethernet, you know, and the work, you know, and you have no idea what's, you know, what happens to it. But um, I, because I'm a, you know, a screenwriter in writing, and I'm used to that process from on from that, mm -hmm. um, then I, it doesn't really bother me. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, th these next these two films come out on April twelfth. Yeah. You excited? Of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. I mean, I haven't seen them, so I'm interested. Like, oh, how you they... haven't you haven't seen them either? No, I haven't. Oh, okay. I mean, I know. And then with the like I said, with these things, you never know what gets. I know actually that Arcadian that some of our scenes got cut because the story got changed in the edit. Okay. But the director, Ben, wrote me a really nice email uh, the other day, which is lovely. And then the Samuel Jackson one, I play his girlfriend, and there's an aspect of our relationship which is the center point of the film. So I, I, I have to be there somewhere because that's what it'll send <laughs> But, yeah, no, I'm excited. I'm excited to see them, and I'm excited to, yeah, get back to work. I, like, I really love doing these things also in Europe. Like, the damage was in Edinburgh, and the Arcadian was done in the Irish countryside, and it's it's fun to be out out there. Uh, one one last question before you go. Uh, there was a clip that I was watching of yours where you, um, you come into a tent and this dude's like you're talking to this guy, but yes. he's clearly not alive. Yes, he had an what? insulin overdose. Uh, okay. Uh, what yeah. can can you tell me what that was? Oh, what was it? Uh... It was a, uh, oh, I'd have to look at it. It was a, it was a, I, I'll find TV it. Show. Don't worry. <laughs> American TV show. And that one, again, we filmed in Prague, well, no, Budapest. So I got to go to Budapest. That was fun. Oh, wow. And be in a forest with him. Um, it's an American right. TV show, but I'm blanking on the name. Oh, don't worry. I'll find it. That's, uh, <laughs> I just thought I'd ask you, but I was, uh, that, that freaked me out too. I was like, all right. Because your face <laughs> changes like so, like your face, the whole, your whole mood changes so quick. I was like, it's like, wow, that's pretty good. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Where can people find you? Can people follow you on, on social media or anything? Sure. You can find me on Instagram. Oh, cool. Yeah. I uh, will have, I will, I will make sure I follow you on Instagram. Um, so I can keep up and also because I want to see like, 
I want to watch this both those movies. So I'm curious to I'll, I'm going to let you know what I think. Okay. Not that it matters, but you know. Yes, please do. Come on. You're really good, and I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Thank you, thank you. It's nice to meet you. And did the sun? Did you get? Did it get dark? I feel like. No, and uh, eclipse. Uh, it should have happened already. So if it, oh maybe it did. I don't know. I have no idea. I, well, that's why I didn't pay attention to it. I'm like I'm not anywhere near where it's gonna really do anything. So I'm just no. You know. I, my cousin went to Mexico to see it from Vancouver because I think oh, in really? Vancouver we weren't gonna get it. So yeah. Oh Hopefully. wow! But but if it was cloudy, then you didn't get to see anything. So it's like you're really taking your taking a risk there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. I mean, I watched a bunch of stuff on TV. And people were, you know, people getting married and all this other stuff that's happening during it. You know, it's all good. That's funny. That's funny. Well, well, I had a great time talking to you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry, I lost <laughs> again. Thank, I keep doing this. Um, uh, thank you. I appreciate it as well. And um, yeah, it was really nice to meet you. And yeah, let me know when when I can listen to this. Oh, absolutely. It'll be out um, probably next week. Okay. It'll be out before the before um, either the same day or the day before um, your your films come out. Okay. So. All right. Awesome. All right, Darren, we'll have a great day. You too. I'm sorry I had to get you up so early today. Oh, that's okay. No, you know what? I, I got the time wrong. So I was ready at 8, okay. and then it was actually 10. Uh, oh. Right yes, but I was ready. Wow. Well. <laughs> and I was like, because it's London. Anyway, I always get my time mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, well. I'm off to the gym. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate it.